All right. Well, good morning, everyone. That's about the best I expected. <laughs> so the uh, secretary has uh, determined that we do have a quorum. Thank you for being here. Thank you, quorum. Um, so this is um, our agenda. Uh, it is uh, a little bit uh, different compared to uh, non-election year. We are moving uh, the president-elect report up uh, so that it will come after the financial report so that the nomination committee will have uh, some time to count the ballots um, while the rest of us are having the rest of that fun stuff. Um, so. Uh, let's call this meeting to order, and thank you for being here on time, because we do have to end on time, or we will be in trouble with Anna. <laughs> so, uh, let's uh, turn it over to Dan. Okay, first thing first, I'd like to remind you, uh, we have to approve the minutes. The minutes were published for general consumption from the last GLPA business meeting in the winter newsletter on page 45. Is there any motion from the floor to approve the minutes? All right, I have uh, and a second. Great. All in favor? Actually, Jeff has to say that. All in favor, say aye. aye. All right. The approval of the minutes passes. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Sherry. Sherry Adams uh, would like to present the financials. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so um, one of the things that I want to do is not just share with you the account balances, but also just to spend a moment to explain one of the um, uh, one of the items that we're asking for you to uh, vote on today about changing the fiscal year. And so hopefully that'll be evident with what I'm sharing with you uh, this morning. So first of all, we have numerous accounts. We have our main checking account. Uh, the conference account was not used this year as a result of this not being a GLIPA year. It's just an extension of our checking account. Uh, the PayPal is where most of the revenue comes in from our conferences as we move forward because of the registration online. Uh, the Image Bank is run by Dave Leak, and although there are some show kits and items that are purchased online, uh, some of that revenue comes directly into the PayPal account, but he does maintain an opportunity for people to send checks, and so we see a balance there. Um, and then the gift shop. So Todd DeZeo uh, runs our gift shop and um, is able to also provide materials, but most of that goes through the online shop. So what I wanted to share with you is the account balances as of a year ago. So our fiscal year normally ends at the end of September, September 30th. And I wanted to show you that even though uh, we had a, uh, a revenue balance of 169000 we were in the midst of uh, having the Flint conference, which didn't really happen for a few weeks after our fiscal year. So you'll see that there was additional revenue that was collected, but then a greater amount of money that was expended. So. Um, at the end of the conference, it was approximately 125000 was our balance. But as you can see, we generated most of the revenue prior to the end of the fiscal year. Then we generated most of the expenses following the end of the fiscal year for, um, for that particular uh, conference. So um, just to give you a comparison, our conference expenses uh, at the taking into account the conference expenses and the rest of the revenue, uh, so shortly after the conference was over, the balance was about 125000 Mid-year, at the end of March, uh, we had generated approximately the same amount in revenue as we had in expenses, so we continued with about the same balance there. Moving into our current fiscal year that ended uh, as of September 30th, the balance in the checking, uh, you see the conference um, was the same as we had in um, uh, our PayPal was 143000 because that's where most of the money was deposited for this particular conference. Glipple was responsible for accepting all of the revenue because of the um, advanced development of our capabilities on our particular uh, website. So Glipple was responsible for that. So most of the money for this conference came in through PayPal. 
Some did come in through checks and some did come in through wire transfers that did um, uh, show up in our checking account. Uh, the image bank uh, and the gift shop. So those are all reflected amounts. So it kind of falsely shows that our balance at the end of this fiscal year was 279000 So what I wanted to do here was show you uh, this is um, accounting for all of the revenue that came into uh, checks, wire transfers, and PayPal. Uh, that's the amount, the $168,000 came in for the conference up to this point. There were some um, lagging, uh, a small amount of revenue that still will be reported for this conference. Uh, we had conference expenses. Uh, that $3,065 accounted for the $3,000 in seed money that we provided to St. Louis uh, to begin the conference many months ago. Uh, and then $65 was an expense for some ribbons that GOP um, uh, purchased. So it shows that more closely related would be $108,000 as to what the balance for um, GLIPA is at this particular time. So does anybody have any questions? I just wanted um, for you to see that uh, there's a very valid reason for asking you to approve the uh, suggested change in our fiscal year. If we have it in the springtime, then all of the revenue and all of the expenses for the current year will be reflected within one particular year, rather than carrying over either revenue and or expenses into the next fiscal year. So by changing that, that's what we're attempting to do. Anybody have any questions about the accounts? Okay, and one other financial matter is uh, taxes were paid, or not paid, but reported. So we file uh, a report to the IRS every year as a uh, 501c6 um, that's been reported. So that's all the financials. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify, um what Sherry was mentioning about changing the fiscal year, that is one of the, the bylaw questions. And we're going to be doing uh, the bylaw ballot in just a minute. So uh, could you please uh, join me in thanking Sherry for all the hard work that she's been doing. And thank you also to Dan Tell for his work uh, in preparing the minutes and all the work that he does to record what we do as an executive committee and as an organization. So thank you, Dan. All right, so next up is the president-elect's report. Um, so the president-elect is the um, chair of the nomination committee. Uh, that we'll do that first. And uh, so the nomination committee, uh, consisting of uh, Tiffany Stone Wolbrick, uh, Mark Webb, uh, April Witt, uh, Keith Davis, and myself, um, put together what I think is an amazing uh, ballot. And uh, nomination committee, if you guys could help me uh, pass out the officer's ballots right now, that would be great up here in the front. Um, and so please don't uh, complete the ballots yet. Uh, we're just going to uh, pass them out. We'll just want to make sure we don't have any uh, nominations from the floor uh, that we need to do as, as write-ins. While we're uh, passing those out, um, it's always unfortunate that only one person can serve in each of these uh, elected capacities. So I want to thank everyone who agreed to be on the ballot. Um, we will make sure that, uh, that the candidates you know, stand and wave so that if you are uh, new to the organization, you have a chance to put the Names with the faces. Hopefully, you had a chance to uh, get to know these amazing people uh, so far throughout the conference. Only one ballot per person. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Illinois. So while we're uh, passing these out, um, let's uh, introduce um, 
our incredible uh, slate of candidates. For uh, president-elect, uh, Waylena McCulley, can you wave or stand? Or... Thank you. Mark Reed, also for president-elect. Uh, Secretary, uh, Renee Kerrigan. And Dan Tell. For Treasurer, Sherry Adams. Shannon Schmall. IPS Representative, Mike Smale. And Anna Green. Do we have any nominations for uh, any of these elected positions? Just using my teacher wait time. <laughs> All right, not hearing any nominations, we will uh, declare this to be the uh, ballot. Uh, please uh, make an obvious uh, check mark or X in uh, the blank indicating the person that you are voting for. And then fold the ballot just once, please, just in half uh, to uh, kind of provide a little privacy. Hold up those ballots, and uh, members of our nomination committee will come by and collect them. All right, any other ballots that need to be collected? Hold those up nice and high, please. And then if I could have um, a couple of volunteers uh, help to pass out the uh, bylaw change document and the uh, bylaw ballot, uh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. So there is a five-page document that the uh, bylaw committee uh, has created that I think provides a wonderful explanation of the changes that the executive committee uh, who is endorsing the um, the work of the bylaw committee uh, they're pr proposing these um, excellent changes we hope you will uh, consider them Dan you want to say a few things about uh, about the document? Yeah, um, so uh, of course this document is also published in the newsletter um, on page 33 of the summer newsletter to give everyone plenty of time to review it. So hopefully you had a chance already. You might notice this is the first year, historically every time we've changed the bylaws before this, 
it has been just a bulk action. You you either accept all the recommended bylaw changes or vote against all the recommended bylaw changes. This year, because we have several sort of potentially controversial changes, we wanted to give everyone a chance to sort of vote on these in sections. So obviously, Sherry's already talked about item one, which is changing our fiscal year, which I th hope you can see is actually somewhat important. Um, it's very helpful for both budgeting as well as for tax purposes, GLPA's fiscal year is already April 1st to March 31st. The second one is related to several changes in the membership. Um, as you go through, the through this document, I see there's a rationale for each of these changes. Several of them relate to the fact that we have no idea what uh, the founders of GLPA meant by some of these categories, and we've never had them in practice. Um, but the, the most important change that happens in this there's been a lot of debate over the years about um, you know, sponsors who are members and what the vendor membership means and having this, this bifurcated category of members, um, as well as there are sponsors who sort of don't really want to be members when they attend. So the compromise we sort of reached in the committee is um, it would mean eliminating the vendor membership category that has existed previously and create a new exhibiting sponsor category that is a non-member who is allowed to attend the conference. Part of the issue is you had to be a member to attend the conference. This would allow those vendors, uh, sponsors, who don't want to be a member to still attend the conference, and those who do can, of course, register as a regular member and are welcome to vote and participate in all GLPA activities, which we you know many do. Um, we also have several logistics things related to how the executive committee votes. Many of these, of course, were developed in the era of postal mail and not electronic mail, and since we are now in an electronic era, we can both conduct electronic votes and we don't need as much time to allow for mail to go back and forth. Uh, da, da, da. So there's a whole bunch related to sort of that. Um, there's also uh, one small shift in the duties. We uh, added that the uh, treasurer is responsible for the tax filings and the liability insurance. There is a minor typo in that, which means someday we'll have to vote to fix that typo. <laughs> um, unfortunately, because of the way the bylaws are written, we can't just go back and fix it after we published it, and nobody pointed it out to us. So we're not perfect. Um, we also have a few financial things related to basically conference planning. Uh, the conferences are way, way, way bigger than the founders ever anticipated. As a result of that, we actually we do some things that were against the bylaws historically. Um, and so there are some things that would actually be really helpful to sort of clear up that allow us for the, the plan of these conferences at this enormous scale, um, especially the fact that the executive committee doesn't really plan the conferences. We, we, we turn it over to a local host. Uh, question five uh, is some procedural things related to voting. Again, um, sort of updating some of the time frames because of the fact that we don't live in the, in, well, we can do this without postage. We can do this in the electronic era, so some things don't need as much time. Uh, and finally, question six is actually one that uh, was not developed by the committee, but was submitted by the membership. Um, and it was a minor change to clarify the activities of the organization. Uh, it was specifically related to like, um, there was an, a question from the membership of endorsing uh, organization activities like the March for Science, and in general, just advocating for science policy in the Great Lakes region and beyond. Um, we are a 501c6 nonprofit which does allow us to do some activity of that nature as long as it is not the majority or, or a significant portion of what we do. Um, so uh, going through the bylaws, it was sort of unclear what the stance of the bylaws really was, and so we wanted to add some clarifying language. Um, uh, did, did, there was something I was gonna say about this also. Oh, um, you might notice uh, if you are familiar with IPS's bylaws, IPS is able to make some stances specifically on some on some items, and in fact, they did um, issue some statements earlier in the year on certain things that occurred. Um, so, yeah, that covers the bylaw changes. Any question uh, for Dan and uh, and his committee on the bylaw changes? Okay. Uh, let's show our appreciation for the hard work that they have put in. And if we could have some volunteers to pass out the ballots. Also, I should recognize the bylaw committee who worked on this. It was uh, chaired by the secretary, that is myself, um, and include contributions from Gary Tomlinson, Dave Leak, and Gary Beckstrom. You might notice a lot of GLPA past presidents in there. 
So for each of the uh, questions uh, for uh, the bylaw sections, uh, please circle yes or no, indicating your support for these changes. And when you are finished, please hold it up. As you're working, if you uh, have any questions, uh, please uh, raise your hand or come up and uh, talk to Dan, and he'd be happy to answer them for you, I'm sure. And since the nomination uh, committee is back there already counting the officers' ballots, if we could have a couple of volunteers to help uh, collect the bylaw ballots, that would be wonderful. Any more bylaw ballots still out there? Okay. While we are uh, allowing people to finish up the bylaw ballots, we're going to be handing out uh, the conference, uh, GLIPA's conference questionnaire, uh, the one that informs the work of the conference planning committee. So uh, Gary and a couple of volunteers will be passing out those uh, surveys. Uh, so at any you know, dull moment in the meeting, uh, if you would like to work on those, uh, that would be, uh, wait. They're all dull moments. I heard that. Um, you can work on that survey. We would uh, hope to uh, collect those maybe at the end of this meeting. Yep. And uh, if not, if you need more time, uh, at least get them to Gary before you leave the conference. And... As you finish up uh, the, the last of the uh, bylaw ballots, uh, please hold those up so that we can get those collected and counted. Uh, while we're finishing that up, I will finish uh, the president-elect um, report. So one of the things that we did new uh, this year was the uh, state chair ballots. Uh, so if anybody has feedback about what worked and what didn't work about that process, please know that uh, even though it's a little extra work for us, uh, we are trying to just make sure that um, 
we're providing opportunities for people to uh, offer their services uh, to become a state chair and also trying to uh, make sure that we are providing a process that does not put the chairs, the current chair person, uh, in an awkward position having to run a, uh, an election for their own position. So thank you for your cooperation on that. But we do, uh, since this was a new, t uh, a new thing for us, and uh, we would like to make it as smooth as possible. If you have any feedback, we would appreciate it. Thank you for all, uh, everybody that helped with that. Uh, the president-elect is also the chair of the scholarship committee. Uh, we did receive uh, 14 applications this year, and uh, 10 were awarded. And that is uh, it for the president-elect report. Uh, we'll come back to that again um, once we know uh, the results of the, the two ballots. Uh, next uh, is the uh, president's report. Uh, so as um, I think you know by now, uh, our president, uh, Dale, um, Dale Brown, was not able to make it. Uh, she sends her greetings and uh, her regrets, um, but uh, she is at home uh, caring for her husband um, and uh, hopes to be able to join us at the, the spring meeting. Uh, as uh, past president by that point, and um, then again with us uh, next fall at the conference. So um, I know that uh, she isn't here, but I would like to uh, express my gratitude, and we could all express our gratitude for her work and her service as president. The president would normally, uh, if this was a Saturday business meeting, also announce the awards so that they can be uh, incorporated uh, into the minutes. I uh, think that would be a little unfair for us to <laughs> announce the awards now and then try to look surprised uh, at the banquet tonight. So uh, we will add those into the minutes uh, after tonight, if you don't mind. Also, uh, one of the uh, sobering duties of the, uh, the president at this point, uh, usually at the banquet, but since uh, we're sharing our uh, time with the other regionals at the banquet tonight, we wanted to um, take a moment to remember some of our uh, past uh, GLPA members who uh, have died this uh, past year. So we have uh, actually uh, lost four uh, former uh, GLIPA members, and we wanted to just help everybody kind of recognize uh, who these people were if they haven't been around here for a while. Uh, so um, we just have uh, put together just a few graphics. Not enough to honor the uh, wonderful contributions that they have provided for Glippa over the years, but enough to remind us and help us to show our respect. And now, I know we're already observing a, a moment of silence, but to formalize that, let's take a moment to remember our, our colleagues. Thank you for that. If we uh, have time at the end, we could also even take a moment to uh, share uh, memories of um, these former members. All right, next up is the secretary report. Okay, I still have the mic. This is obviously the hardest one because I have to try and write and talk at the same time. Um, the secretary uh, published the 
spring executive meeting newsletter minutes in the summer GLPA newsletter. Um, there was a tight turnaround this year, as well as uh, chair at the bylaw committee. You just voted on the bylaws, so you got to see the results of that work. Um, and as well as, of course, publish the, the previous year's um, fall executive committee meeting minutes and the business meeting minutes in the newsletter. These ones will, of course, appear in the winter newsletter for your review, as well as all the things that we did at GLPA exec and all of the electronic votes that we held between the conferences. So you'll be able to see everything that we're doing and deciding. Um, one important thing that we did do this year that I want to call attention to, um, based on some, uh, some comments, uh, at the spring meeting we started looking into what we were at first calling a harassment policy within GLPA to address issues of um, you know, any kind of harassment. Um, so there was a small committee formed. We started looking into this. What we ultimately uh, ended up doing after we reviewed a few existing policies and got some advice is we found um, a really good code of conduct that was being used by some other conferences in sort of the general astronomy community. Um, it's, uh, it's really nice because it's a Creative Commons license, so we could uh, change it and modify it. Um, and uh, it was most recently used by the, the Kepler and K2 conference that was held at NASA Ames a little bit ago. Um, and it seemed like a really great guideline for our community and our conferences. And the executive committee voted to adopt it uh, earlier this year, or um, well, three, four days ago. <laughs> it's been a long conference, it turns out. Um, and uh, as we have adopted it, you can already find the new GLPA code of conduct on our website. It will officially go into effect on the vernal equinox, but hopefully it's guidelines that we can all start observing anyway. And hopefully, you know, most of us were observing it. Um, and of course, we'll be developing procedures to deal with any issues in the future. But it seems like an important thing because, of course, we value the diversity of our membership and want to respect everyone's place here in GLPA. And I think that concludes my report. So if, if you uh, would like to read that uh, statement, it is under the About tab, uh, Position Statements. And then uh, there's a link to take you all the way down to the, the code of conduct. So thank you, Dan, for that report and for um, other people helped you with that, uh, that draft. Do you want to recognize those people? Sure, because a lot of uh, people, both on and off the executive committee, helped a lot. Anna Green was a major help, as was Paulette Epstein, Gary Tomlinson, Dave Leak and Bart Benjamin. So thank you everyone who contributed something to this process. Let's, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Dan, for that report. Uh, coming up next is uh, Sherry Adams again for the non-financial part of her treasury report. Thank you. So um, one of the responsibilities of the treasurer is to maintain liability insurance policies. We are insured through Cincinnati. It's a very well-respected uh, insurance company. We have two policies. We have a, a general liability. It pretty much covers if uh, the someone within the organization causes a problem, and this would generally take place at a conference, uh, that that's where the policy would, would be involved. We also hold a policy that is a director's and officer's liability policy and that is with um, also the Cincinnati Co Insurance Company. Now, um, which is unfortunate that the world has changed in such a way that they automatically uh, have a terrorist policy that you have to write out of your policy. It's a very insignificant financial amount, and we allowed them to, to continue that portion. Uh, there is a cyber uh, portion that we did decide as an executive committee to add onto the policy this year because of um, the higher incidence of problems that people have experienced. So we added that into our policy. So those policies are renewable um, in, in August. The policies themselves are written for three-year terms. Uh, we have to go through an application process every three years, and then every year there is a report that needs to be filed with the insurance to update them with um, our information. So that has been done, and that comes due every year in August. Uh, another non-financial is that uh, GLIPA as an organization is, light, is, um, uh, is out of the state of Michigan, 
And so we're registered as an entity, as a nonprofit organization with Michigan, and that um, is renewed through them. It's an insignificant amount of $20, but it is something that's required uh, that we need to maintain. And so that's been, uh, that's been renewed. Anyway, questions? The insurance policies have changed. The liability is $589, I believe. That's the general liability. And the directors and officers is $1,344. Five eighty nine. That's correct for the liability, and one thousand three hundred and forty four dollars for the directors and officers. And there should be no organization that is without that. And as um, we hope to never need it, we hope that it is money that we spend that we don't um, that we don't draw on it. And very quickly, Ed, too, um, the, the general insurance does not cover an incident that causes the cancellation or a major issue at the conference. Uh, part of the reason GLPA maintains a large treasury is we self-insure for that because that insurance policy would be extremely expensive. So we basically carry enough in the treasury that if something major happened to the conference, we could basically issue refunds, we could pay for things that went wrong. Um, so that's why we have such a large treasury all the time. And most nonprofits like this do. That's sort of just being held for that. Any questions for Sherry? Other questions? All right, so first of all, I'm thankful that uh, we did not have any incidents before we uh, got these insurance policies, but actually it's been uh, under uh, Sherry's watch that we have incorporated these things, and she's set up an excellent relationship with uh, this insurance company, and they have uh, served us well. So thank you very much, Sherry, for all that work. Next up, Mike Swell, IPS report. Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Smell. I'm your IPS representative, and I just want to talk uh, for a couple minutes about what all is going on with the International Planetarium Society. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Galippa is an affiliate member of the International Planetarium Society, which is a worldwide professional development organization for our field. Most recently, IPS has a new website. The URLs here at the bottom, ips-planetarium.org, that's the same, that hasn't changed. But the content of the site is uh, quite a bit prettier and quite a bit more functional. One of the long-standing complaints is that information on the site got buried really easily and it was really hard to drill down and find things. So uh, it's a lot more functional. It was uh, supposed to be up and ready and completely done by the beginning of this conference, but Hurricane Irma had some negative impact on the place, the company that was actually building the site, so some material will still be populated throughout the rest of this calendar year. But give it a look, take a spin around. Uh, especially one thing I would like to uh, highlight is a planetarium finder. So there are a lot of like databases of the world's planetarium websites floating around out there. Uh, and IPS uh, has put one together uh, thanks to pretty much the hard work of two Glippins, uh, Adam Lease, and then also uh, data that Dale Smith has curated on the world's planetariums. And this, uh, IPS's new goal with this website is for this to be the online planetarium resource for the community. So anything and everything relating to our dome. So uh, give it a look, take a spin, and hopefully you'll find some uh, useful content there. Uh, you also might have heard uh, at dinner last night, uh, Bjorn Voss from the Planetarium in Munster, Germany, mentioned this, but we are just six short years away from the centennial of the planetarium. Uh, IPS has created a task force to work on activities and content and things that can be shared and take place at planetariums all around the globe all throughout the year uh, 2023. Um, this is uh, just a, a nice sketch of the, the original planetarium uh, there at the Deutsches Museum. Uh, uh, information will be added to the IPS website on that if you're looking. You can find Bjorn Voss, he's currently the IPS representative for the German-speaking Planetarium Association, so you can find his contact info there. He's casting a wide net, he wants suggestions and thoughts and ideas, uh, and he'll, he'll be forming a, a working group and they'll come up with some great ideas that we can all take advantage of. IPS has conferences every two years, a little bit different than Glippa and the other regions that are usually uh, every year. Uh, the next one is coming up in Toulouse, France next July. You might have heard Marc Mouton from uh, the Planetarium at Cité de l'Espace, who gave a presentation yesterday afternoon about the conference. Um, 
There was there have been a lot of uh, we've mentioned this conference a fair bit in articles in the Global Newsletter, and we made it around some of the state meetings. We sent out the video that he sent around to some of the state meetings earlier this year. Uh, long story short, uh, registration should be open before the end of this year. They're still trying to lock down some of the financials, but uh, registration is targeted to be right around 400 euros. There are 400 hotel rooms within a five-minute walk of the site, uh, ranging from kind of 80 euros to about 160 euros. Uh, something that is also an option that many uh, folks in our region tried at the IPS conference in Warsaw last year is just looking up Airbnb in the region. In a lot of times you can find some really nice apartments, really good price, and save on some of those higher hotel costs. Um, a couple other quick things there. There will be a, there'll be a dome fest attached to it, uh, conference tours to Pictomedia Observatory, and a gastronomy tour, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, expect to hear more and more stuff uh, both uh, in the Glippa newsletter and then also uh, the, the uh, IPS uh, website, uh, which is not on here. It's IPS2018Toulouse.org. Um, oh, one, uh, one more important thing. Paper submissions uh, were slated to be closed a couple weeks ago. They've actually extended them through October 27th to give attendees at this Pleiades conference a chance to learn a little bit more about the conference and potentially submit their uh, papers or workshops or panels or discussion groups or presentations to it. There will be a big focus on live presentation at this conference. Uh, of the 100 abstracts already submitted, 25% are of an educational nature. They cover educational means and methods and content. So uh, uh, definitely a heavy education focus at this conference. Also at the IPS Council meeting over the weekend, we selected a site for IPS 2020, and it is at the TELUS World of Science in Edmonton. Uh, the conference will be in late June 2020. And it's, uh, it's a nice mashup because it's the 60th anniversary of the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium, which was the first planetarium in Canada. It was in Edmonton. Uh, it's on the grounds of the park where TELUS World of Science Edmonton is currently. It's been closed for a couple decades now, but it is going to be renovated and reopened and will function again as a planetarium for the conference. Uh, in addition to being the 60th anniversary of planetariums in Canada, it's also the 60th anniversary of Ian McLennan in the planetarium field in 2020. So a uh, nice little neat bow tying everything together there. Now, last but not least, something we talked about last year and we've been talking about for the past couple of years is IPS is, uh, has a working group called Vision 2020 that is doing some sort of institutional soul, soul, working, soul searching and kind of road mapping to get the organization going and growing into the future. Uh, they have a number of committees with GLIPA uh, membership and representation, Dan Tell, uh, the IPS president-elect Mark Subrao, also very involved in Vision 2020. And uh, one of the things that was decided at the IPS council meeting is that the council has decided to move in the direction from the current model of regional affiliate representation to more of a board structure. So the way this works right now is IPS has uh, elected, off uh, elected officials, like we do here in GLIPA, president, past, president-elect, uh, a secretary, and then a treasurer and membership chair. But then each of the 22 regional uh, affiliates, like GLIPA, have a representative that they send to these annual IPS council meetings. Uh, so what IPS is attempting to do is attempting to sort of focus that group, make them a little bit leaner, a little more efficient, and a little more functional as well. Uh, the current structure is fairly large, and whereas GLIPA, we are the far and away the healthiest IPS affiliate, there are 500 IPS members, 112 of them reside in the Glipa region. So thank you for all of you who are IPS members uh, for what we contribute to the organization. There are a number of other regionals that are not quite so healthy and not so active. So the council is trying to, uh, again, better structure the organization, uh, Vision 2020 in the council, trying to better structure the organization working forward to allow the group to go and grow. So the way that will shake out has not been determined. Uh, the IPS council chose to uh, have Vision 2020 submit recommendations for how that board structure might work. Uh, the way that would work is basically there would be a number of elected board positions made up of IPS members who would meet with those officers. Uh, so it would not be as large it is, as it is now, uh, but again, the exact makeup of that board, how those, how those elections happen, the structure, the representation, how it plays out uh, is to be determined. But the hope is that it will be all ready for a vote of IPS membership at the council meeting in Toulouse next year. So uh, the IPS exec is looking to work pretty quickly on this and come up with uh, that sort of new roadmap. So with all that out of the way, any questions about IPS? Mr. Latch, our IPS president. Just uh, a reminder that we have a whole variety of new membership categories, everything from uh, student grades to new career starters in the field. Uh, we also have reduced uh, the rates for institutional and corporate memberships. There used to be sort of a, a first year sort of uh, <coughs> dual payment, you might say, or, or startup fee, which has been eliminated. Uh, 
Um, and of course, the new website has all that information. Uh, but uh, yeah, the uh, council is, is hoping that uh, you know, with all the Vision 2020 stuff to move the organization forward into the future to be able to deliver a lot more member services. So if you haven't checked out you know, the Dome on the website and all the reported things that are there for a variety of educational uh, resources, please do so. Uh, and with IPS elections coming up next year as well, along with rolling out uh, this piece to council, the, the plans would be that we would roll out that structural change to the membership because the membership would need to vote on that. And so that would go out on the ballot and call for elections for officers. Uh, and again, we encourage people to, uh, who might be interested in serving IPS as an officer to talk with Mark George, um, who is our elections committee chair, uh, and talk to, uh, you know, past or present officers. I'll, you know, our Subrao is probably here somewhere in the room. Maybe. Center uh, back. And of course, Dale and Dave, and uh, there's been a variety of others that from this, this group who have served, so please do talk to them if you're interested in that to get an idea of what it entails. Like I was saying, definitely check out. So, for those of you who are at the Indiana and Illinois State meetings, we talked a little bit about those new membership categories. The prices were still kind of in flux at the time. The information wasn't up on the website. A lot of people did express interest in that, especially at the very, very affordable membership prices. But uh, check out the new IPS website. All the details there, all the data, the career starter level, uh, the develop, there's a, sort of an emerging communities level, uh, retired emeritus options, all sorts of great stuff. Student. Uh, student, yes. Yeah, student career starter. <laughs> there's, there are several. Check it out. Uh, anybody else? Cool. Well, thanks for your attention. And it's been a pleasure to represent the region for these last two years. Yes, thank you very much, Mike, for all that you've done. Um, next up is conference planning. Gary Tomlinson. Shannon, come on down. They tell me the reason GLP maintains liability insurance in case Gary Tomlinson says something stupid. <laughs> Actually, I was told by the president-elect last night just before I introduced Ron that we had already introduced or approved that conduct policy, wiped out half my introduction. <laughs> Shannon's going to tell us about the next conference that she is hosting in, at uh, East Lansing in 2018. And uh, do I have to tell some more jokes? Oh, good. I'll get my head out of the way. There we go. All right. So we have a pretty conference logo already. So thanks to Shane Horvatton for that. Um, so, GLIPA 2018 will be in East Lansing, Michigan at Abrams Planetarium. Um, and our dates right now are set for October 10th through the 13th. It was pretty much the only weekend without a home game, um, so that's why. Um, and unfortunately, football really does affect our campus a lot, uh, so we do have to work around that. And so um, that will come up later on. Uh, but just for those of you who haven't been there or aren't familiar with it. The Abrams Planetarium is right in the center of Michigan State University campus. We have a 50-foot dome, and we just upgraded uh, to Digistar 6. Uh, and we have 141 seats. And um, it's, it is right nice, because once you get to the planetarium, we're in walking distance to the edge of campus, to most places, for the most part. Some walks are a bit longer than others. Um, but that is us. We've been there since um, 1964, right? Okay, they're telling me yes. All right, um, right now the, the plan is to be at the Henry Center, which is a, um, for most of the conference, and then bus people to the planetarium. Unfortunately, we can't get any sort of space on campus during the week because classes are going on. We will probably spend a lot of time on the Saturday um, on campus, though, in order to, to get people there a lot more. Um, the Henry Center is the only place that would guarantee space more than a year out. Um, because of the football schedule. Um, but we will also be looking into the Kellogg Center now that we are only a year out. Um, they would not guarantee space for us at all um, and reserve the right to cancel our reservation if football got in the way. So uh, that's why they, we didn't book them originally. But we will look into them, um, mostly as a way to try to see if there's a way to cut down costs. This might end up being a bit more of an expensive conference than normal. 
Um, but also one thing to keep in mind for this conference is that this year, um, uh, for 2018, we are going to be changing things a little bit. So normally we start on a Wednesday evening and end Saturday afternoon around lunchtime or so. Uh, we're going to be extending into Saturday evening. This is something Gary mentioned last year in Flint. Um, the idea is that we'll keep the same amount of content that we have in Glippa, but we won't be starting so early and ending so late all the time. So we'll try to get the hours. Um, <laughs> we're going to try. <laughs> um, so I do not plan on adding in anything um, too much extra stuff. But um, <laughs> and by that, I mean none. Uh, so we will try to have more reasonable hours, I guess. Um, but also what that means is this is the first year we're doing that. So you know there might be some growing pains. And so bear with us, um, including the conference fee might be a little bit higher, um, which I will get to. Um, and just a little bit about MSU, since that'll be sort of the immediate surrounding area that we'll be spending most of our time. We have a lot of wonderful attractions. The MSU Museum, the Broad Art Museum, which is our new modern art museum. It was put up about five years ago, I think. Um, really interesting, beautiful architecture there. A lot of weird jutting angles inside the building. So it's a, a great thing to go see, especially if you are into art. Um, we have our 4-H children's garden, our bill garden, um, botanical gardens. We are an agricultural school, so there's a lot of uh, wonderful things around. And that's just a few things. And then, of course, the dairy store, which has delicious ice cream, all named after, like, Big, Big Ten football schools. So uh, my favorite is the Terrapin Toffee Crunch. Um, and then in the surrounding area, for when you are there, we have restaurants for everybody, from meat to leaf. These are actual restaurants. Meat's pretty good barbecue. Leaf is a really good uh, salad bar. So I just think it's funny that we have those two restaurants with those names. Um, all right. And right now, what we're looking at with the Henry Center is you can't see that because it's cut off. Um, but about 200 to 225 for registration, plus about 150 for a meal package, including the banquet, which brings us to about 350 to 375 total, which does put us on the more expensive end for Aglippa. But again, we are working to get those costs down, so we don't expect them to go any higher than that, and hopefully they'll be lower. So we are working on that, and we'll let you know. All right. Any questions? All right, Gary, you have anything else? Sure. One of the things we're wrestling with is uh, we're going to end the conference later on Saturday. So the question is, do we end it at 6 o'clock and say, get out of here, go get supper? Do we go to 8, 9 o'clock and, and include the meal Saturday night? So I'd always like to do a straw poll. Ending about 6 how many people would be in favor of that? Raise your hands. How many people would be in favor of going to 9 o'clock? With the food, uh, yes. Uh, slight margin ending at 6, but fairly close. Thank you for that decisive decision. <laughs> the hotel was about $109, as I recall. Um, So if we do end up going at the Henry Center, there's attached hotel as well as the University Club, which has a restaurant, by the way, as well as like spas and, and gyms for everybody to use while you're there. Um, and the hotels are, would be about $109 um, for the smaller suites, and I think maybe a little bit more for larger suites. Um, but it's all suites. It's meant for extended stay, and they all have um, little kitchenettes in them as well. Um, um, but it wouldn't hold everybody, so we will have overflow hotels at, at another location as well. So at 6 o'clock on uh, Saturday night, we just say, go to your room and cook your own supper. <laughs> uh, I'd like to invite our 2019 conference host up, but we don't have one. So if you're interested in hosting a GLPA conference, we'd really like to hear from you, so contact me sometime at this conference or afterwards or send me an email. Call me on the phone. <laughs> Did uh, we want to get that on tape? 
or was that a volunteer? Volunteering. Volunteering. <laughs> Talk to Anna if you want to know how easy it is. <laughs> yes, it should. It would be easier. It would be easier. 2020, I can invite the conference host up, but I'm not going to because it's too early to really talk about that. We've just accepted an invitation from Mark Reed in Kalamazoo uh, to, I don't know where he's at. He's over there. So that's what we'll be looking at in 2020. Um, conference photographer, Dan uh, Goins is uh, sitting right over here. He's going to be retiring from that position after Michigan State. Uh, we're looking for a, an apprentice at Michigan State. There are some fringes and benefits, the $200,000 price that we pay. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, no um, meals and registration uh, are covered for our conference photographers. So if you have your own camera equipment um, and are interested in that, go talk to Dan, then come please, please come see me. Uh, Continue filling out those conference evaluations. Don't leave this room with them. Okay, I want those back if possible before the end of this meeting. Um, so I can go home and spend hours and hours and hours looking at them. It's exciting. Well, actually it is, it is exciting. And, and Anna wants to say something about the conference evaluation for the whole conference, I bet. SEPA's helped us put together one, and because I have killed a forest with your conference guides, um, we're sending it out digitally. So please fill that out and help us, so that way we can do this again and make it even better. Uh, you'll all get emails uh, after we sleep. Thanks. So I just heard Anna volunteer to do this again. I know. I know. I'm putting words in my mouth. Okay. Um, we're working towards no on-site registration for future GLP conferences, so keep that in mind for next year. We're, it's causing a lot of hassle to um, the conference host, to, right, Anna? Janet's He's, awesome. Janet is awesome, yes. GLP handled the registration for the conference, in case you didn't already realize that. Um, Briefly, we got uh, 97 new members here at the, at the Pleiades Conference. Through all seven regionals, 42 of those were GLPA members. <laughs> Capacity of this conference was 370? 370? 192 were members. 192 were members. State meeting information? Make sure Bart gets that information so uh, Bart's back there so we can uh, get that in the newsletter. And uh, that is the end of my notes. Uh, anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? So, conference host for. Oh, an incentive. Okay. Yes, uh, if you want to sign up to host the 2019 conference, we'll pay your way to the 2018 conference. Jump right up, anytime, go ahead. And for future. Yeah, that's not, right, not just a special incentive, uh, because obviously the conference host needs to go to the preceding conference to plan it and know, you know, know what to do in case they haven't hosted before. Uh, it's basically necessary. They also have to attend some additional meetings with us. So yes, we are inviting and covering the registration and conference costs for hosts to go to the year preceding when they host. All right. Anything? Uh, any questions for Gary or uh, the the rest of the conference planning committee? All right. Let's show our appreciation for the great work that they do. And since you know this is a multi-regional uh, conference, we won't have uh, an opportunity to express our appreciation as an organization to our hosts. So let's also show our appreciation to Anna and her incredible team. This has been fantastic. I agree. Thank you for that.
an amazing accomplishment to host the first national. And all right, coming up next uh, after your conference planning. Boy, my eyes are getting tired. <laughs> Development. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Leak. Thank you, Jeff. Um, also, thank you to all the people that ask about my well-being by my near heart attack last night at about 10.30. I was a little, little weak in the knees, but I survived it. Uh, the development committee handles the sponsors at our conferences, and at this one, we didn't. Um, the, the way the roles were divided up, maps were the ones that handled uh, all the sponsors. So I can give you a little bit of a report just based on the information I got. Uh, we had 34 sponsors at this conference. Uh, that's the most we've had at any GOPA conference. I think the highest we've had in the last 10 years has been 28. So 34 sponsors at seven sponsorship levels and uh, 5.2 hours of uh, sponsor time, which is actually right in line. The last three years of GOP conferences have been five, five and three quarters, and five and a half, so right in line with that. Uh, about $84,000, that's very unofficial. That's just me adding things up. So uh, this money allows your registration fees to be very low, so please join me, even though most of them are not here, in really thanking these sponsors for uh, helping us out at these con at conferences. And the only other thing I'll, re I'll report, we're going to try something new in uh, East Lansing. We're still working out all the details, but of course before, if a sponsor came in at parallel universe level, they got 20 minutes of time with all of us. Some of them don't need 20 minutes of time. So we're coming up with this little a la carte system, as we're calling it, that uh, we've been working on for about a year and a half now, where uh, after a very small registration fee, the sponsors be able to choose how much space they want and how much time they want and then they pay for that time. So it's not automatic with their sponsorship level. Um, yeah, I got the Air Force protecting my back out there. So, um, so yeah, we can all look at the airplane. Anyway, that will be coming up. So that's, that's my report. Thank you, Jeff. All right, so um, thank you, Dave. For, uh, for helping to coordinate that. And I know this wasn't as uh, big of a year for your position, uh, but thank you for supporting uh, the, the, uh, the, the conference anyway. Uh, as long as Sue's up here, let's uh, go to education next, and then we'll do uh, the, the ballots uh, after that. Okay, so in education, uh, we're working on a couple of things. Can you throw that chart up there? So one of the things that we still need to do a better job of is talking to teachers and school districts and other groups, but the, mostly teachers and, and getting them the message that we're not, you know, coming to the planetarium is not a field trip where you suspend your teaching opportunities, but it's actually a great way to help you meet the standards that you're trying to do and educate the kids. So we're, we're, we're not a break from learning, but we're a way to help out learning. So um, to that end, I've looked up the dates of the um, State Teachers Association meetings, and I'm kind of hoping that some of you will be attending your State Teachers Association meeting. And if you are, would you be willing to, depending on the format that they have, pre do a presentation there that would benefit not only your planetarium, but all of us by just giving us giving them some information. I'm kind of working on, a, on an outline that I'll have within a week or so. Of maybe this is a good idea, depending on how you want to present this. So if you're willing to do that, please let me know. I have the dates of the upcoming meetings there. So. Um, Hopefully I'll hear from a lot of you on that. My second idea is that uh, standards document that we're working on. We had the GLIPA astronomy document was that they, we are trying to align to uh, NGSS. And it's, we're working on that. So it's, a, it's in progress and getting closer to being finished. So that may be a useful document for all of us, whether you're an NGSS state or not. So 
uh, look for information on that upcoming. And I still have a project um, fund opportunity. So if you have a project that you're working on and maybe you think GLIPA could help fund it because it would benefit not just you but the rest of the, the GLIPA community, um, I'm going to put another proposal in the um, upcoming newsletter. Maybe we'll just, instead of saying a project, maybe we'll just say, I have a grant that's possible for you, a small grant for a project that, that will benefit Planetaria in general. And those are the three things I had to say. Any questions? Sue so would definitely give you a thumbs up for that report. So thank you very much, Sue, for the, the work of your committee and uh, for that report. Um, all right, so before we move on to on deck is uh, membership, uh, I do want to report uh, the results uh, of the, uh, the two ballots and to thank the uh, nomination committee uh, for uh, your work on tallying this together. Let's show our appreciation for that. Also want to, uh, once again, show our appreciation to everybody that was on the ballot because once again, only uh, one person gets to serve in each of these uh, elected positions now, right? So the people that uh, are not elected right now, I hope you will uh, consider uh, nomination again in the future. Um, for uh, president-elect, um, Waylena McCulley. For Treasurer, Dan Tell. Uh, Secretary. Secretary, sorry. It's not a job change. And Treasurer, Sherry Adams. And IPS Representative, Mike Smell. Please uh, carefully consider when a nomination committee uh, member uh, like contacts you in the future. Uh, it's, it is an amazing group to be able to uh, work among. Uh, it can be a lot of hours, uh, but each uh, position um, has varying amounts. And uh, we thank everybody for their service on the executive committee. But thank you, especially right now, for those who were willing to uh, brave uh, the ballot. All right, so membership. Oh, bylaws. Uh, yeah, we should uh, report those too, but uh, I have a feeling you, you know what the results are because it was actually overwhelming. Uh, the results, uh, all of the questions were overwhelmingly supported, yes. So thank you for that. And thank you again for the work of the, the bylaw committee. And now membership. All right, excellent. Uh, I'm Paulette Epstein. I'm the membership chair uh, of GLPA. If I haven't uh, introduced myself to you yet, I'm sorry. Uh, come up and uh, introduce yourself. I, I like to get to know all the members uh, in our region. Um, so uh, membership is doing, is doing very, very well. We have uh, currently, let's see, uh, Sorry, 291 members of GLPA. However, that is probably going to change uh, when we uh, allow the sponsors to, uh, it will definitely change when we allow the sponsors to sort of opt out of the membership. Um, so the numbers may d decline uh, at that point. We did have a lot of uh, sponsors who signed up to be GLPA members for this conference specifically because they had to be a uh, member of one of the regions, and uh, the GLPA region was the easier choice for them, even if I did have to track a lot of them down. Um, so, easier for them, yeah. If you want to scroll down to, uh, let's see, standing in front of stuff. Uh, keep going, keep going, keep going. 
I, I kind of want to show, show you guys where uh, all of our, our GLPA members are located. Uh, we have some of these maps already on the website, uh, but these are sort of our updated ones. And you can see that GLPA is not just uh, in our region, but we are starting to become sort of worldwide. We have members all over the place. Uh, they want to take advantage of the benefits that we do have. Um, now, membership right now is sort of a, a com committee of one and some folks that have helped out in the uh, when I kind of go to them begging and pleading on my hands and knees. Uh, but I do want to make this more of a committee. So if anyone is interested in being part of the membership committee, please contact me. I'm looking for at least one person in every uh, state to help me to reach out to those planetariums that don't necessarily know uh, what we are uh, what, what we are and the, the benefits of being a GLPA member. There are some smaller institutions that uh, can't go to conferences and they say, I can't go to conferences, so why would I become a member? And there's way more benefits than that. Um, so like I said, I'm looking for uh, at least one person in every state to sort of help me reach out to, to those folks. And if anyone likes databases, uh, I will also, uh, I'm also looking for someone to sort of help me go through uh, our database and, and uh, make sure that our data is uh, good um, and make sure that we are tracking things the way that we want to track them. So if anyone is interested, uh, please, please, please see me after the business meeting. All right, any questions? Yes. Ah, uh, that's a good question. Probably the map. I think the map is right. Um, I went on, yeah, <laughs> probably the map. Uh, yes, G. Um, I'd, I'd really like to work with the state chairs on that, um, but also if anyone else is interested in helping to reach out to um, folks that are, are not part of our region, and, and they should be because they're part of our region. All right. all right, thank you, Paulette, for all that work and for that report. <laughs> Next up, publications for Benjamin. Isn't this an awesome conference? Wow. Uh, I'm Bart Benjamin. I'm the publications chair. And for those of you who are new to GLPA, what we mean by publications uh, boils down to two publications. The first of which is our GLPA newsletter. This is the printed version, which is now in color. I'll get to that in a moment. The other one, I can't really hold up. But many, many moons ago, it used to look like this. It's our proceedings. It's been a number of years since we've had a printed version that we send to all members. It morphed into a uh, compact disc and then into a DVD. And starting last year, it became all digital, which means that the PDF that contains the actual publication is online along with all the other ones that we've had since we started doing the proceedings back in 1984. Um, and they're all available for download, um, as will the new one when it comes out in uh, a couple of months. Uh, proceedings, or I should say the publications, uh, is not just me. Although I'm the chair and the newsletter editor, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Dale Smith, who is our proceedings editor. And while I'm on the subject of Dale Smith, the big new, one of the big news stories of publications is the fact that we started producing a color printed newsletter. This is really Dale Smith, not me, that is uh, largely responsible for this. I've been producing a color newsletter since 2004, 2005, but it never appeared like this when printed. 
So it was largely because of Dale Smith researching, getting the details, providing all the information that the executive committee used to make the decision. Uh, so this is Dale's project more than mine. So let's acknowledge Dale and thank him. I'm also looking at ways to expand publications to include more than just Dale and me. And I, last <laughs> autumn, I invited members to uh, come forward and provide their talents to make the GLPA newsletter more uh, of a resource to uh, especially the younger members. And I'm pleased to say that uh, we had people come forward. John Forsh, is he here? There he is. Starting uh, with the, uh, uh, starting recently, we have a new regular column uh, that started in autumn, I guess, called Tech Buzz, uh, which he is the editor of. And the new column, well, he's from the Grand Rapids Public Museum, I should add. The new column features production related articles using today's full dome technology. So let me use this occasion to you know, encourage any and all of you to consider writing a tech related article for John's new column, Tech Buzz. And uh, this is one of several ways that we hope to make the newsletter more relevant uh, and more important of a resource to our members. Kind of related to this, uh, I also assembled a publications technology ad hoc committee. And you may say, what's that? That's to help John and me edit and screen some of these tech-related articles to ensure that they are uh, 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 written well. That's usually not the issue. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that they are fair to both members and the sponsors and the manufacturers of the equipment and all of those related issues. So uh, seven members of GLPA's technology committee are serving in that capacity to assist us and to ensure that the articles are fair. Finally, Emily Romy, is she in here? Oh, she's not here, okay. Well, anyway, we'll acknowledge her nonetheless. She is also, she's also from the Grand Rapids Public Museum and she's also volunteered to assist. Uh, some of you may know that she has an extensive art background and in addition to her science background. So uh, I hope she has volunteered to uh, contribute some of these talents to make enhancements to the newsletter in the coming uh, issues. And so you'll undoubtedly hear more about that as time passes. Okay, a couple quick announcements. Uh, the, the summer issue next year will be the 200th newsletter in GLPA's history, not mine, GLPA's. And so uh, thinking of ways to acknowledge the number 200 issue uh, that will occur next summer. As far as newsletter distribution, since people sometimes ask what, uh, how our newsletter is distributed, um, about 72% of uh, our members receive the electronic opt to receive, the electronic version. Uh, just a little under 9% receive the printed newsletter as their choice. And just under 20% receive both versions, both opting to get the electronic and the printed. So that means we send a printed version of the newsletter to about 28% of our members. And it'll be interesting to see what influence the new sexy color printed newsletter has to this number. We don't really know yet. So far we haven't seen a spike, but next year at this time we'll probably have a better indicator on whether or not it changes what would otherwise be kind of a gradual downward slide uh, of the printed version in, in lieu of the uh, digital version. So far more members opt for the digital version uh, compared to the printed, and we'll see what happens as time goes on. I also have to uh, thank uh, the advertisers. We have plenty of them. We have 13 of them. They occupy 14 pages of the newsletter. and. Um, Last, or starting with the color printed newsletter, we also raised advertising rates, essentially doubled them. And uh, we did a little bit of calculations, and uh, we think uh, using the new figures, uh, we will uh, 
uh, receive revenue of about $8,480, as best we estimate. How does this compare to the cost? Well, it doesn't quite offset the cost, but it comes close. Dale Smith's estimate of the cost of producing the color printed newsletter, as well as all the other versions, uh, will be about $9,250, so it'll be just shy of covering the cost, but we were trying to reach close to break even, and we came pretty close. Uh, other thank yous, thanks to our state chairs, Renee Kerrigan, Barb Williams, Shannon Schmoll, Dale Smith, Gene Creighton, uh, and uh, at least for now, I haven't heard otherwise, Dan Tell is the, uh, no? oh, Mary Holt, okay. Um, this just in, okay, who hails from our newest state category, Beyond the Lakes. Uh, finally, uh, getting to the, our other publications, the proceedings, um, uh, the uh, upcoming proceedings of this conference will be our 34th edition and will be Dale Smith's 30th edition since becoming its editor. And just as we did for the first time last year, the uh, proceedings will be all digital, and that means the photographs too, because what used to be on the digital or on the DVD, all the conference photographs, any additional photographs, the group photograph, uh, all of that will be on our website. And uh, we'll send an email when those things are available, directing you to the appropriate pages. But it's all digital now. The, the uh, photographs are posted to Facebook, thanks to Renee, our Facebook uh, uh, moderator. And uh, as well as the, uh, the high-res, full-resolution versions, which are available as a digital download from our website. Uh, finally, the deadline for the winter issue of the GLPA newsletter is fast approaching. Please do your state chairs a favor and start composing your facility reports so that they can submit their report to me early in November. And if so, I can just say if it's not obvious, uh, we added that Beyond the Lakes category, so if you are not in one of the primary GLPA states, send your stuff to Mary Holt, because uh, Glippa actually has, uh, the most populous Glippa state is all the other states, so. <laughs> yeah, Beyond the Lakes is our biggest category. So, if there are no other questions, that's the end of my report. How many I've done? Stand by. Uh, 119. So the next one will be 120. Is there a question back there? Oh, okay. For me. Well, 119 so far. The next one will be 120. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bart, for all your work on the committee and for that report. And Last but not least is technology. Dana Thompson. I love going last. Okay, so uh, this is the part where I thank everyone because as technology committee chair, I really do need a committee to do everything. So, so thanks to everyone who really makes this committee a committee. Uh, to Tom Dobes, who is a site server manager, to Bart Benjamin for helping update content online. Mike Smale keeps our Twitter page active, which is great because I do not do Twitter. Um, to Renee Kerrigan and Bart for also posting to Facebook, which I have started posting to as well. But it's easy when I see like David Hurd featured in a NASA video or Chuck Buter's solar graph on astronomy picture of the day. Um, to Paulette for now uh, boosting some of our Facebook posts to uh, gain more attention for our state meetings and other membership uh, resources. And to everyone else who I didn't mention um, for their efforts, suggestions, and contributions. But especially to our wonderful AV team for this conference and all of our conferences the past few years um, for making us look good. So John uh, Bersh, <coughs> Luke Mitchell, Steve Summercrast, Brian Wolf, and the person who makes it all possible, Tom Dobes. Thank you. <laughs> So also remind the other regions when you see them that we have um, our resources available to anyone um, till the mid of 
middle of November or so, and they just need to contact me for a temporary login, and then they can access all the information and resources that are available on our Glippo website um, for free. And if you want to help in any way, please just let me know. Uh, approach me, talk to me, Facebook me. Any, any means of contact is great. is great. Thank you. Thank you, Dana and committee, for all that work and for that report. Um, yeah, so we do a lot of our business uh, of the organization all year long through the website, and so they do a lot of work. Appreciate that. Uh, so any old business? Hint, hint. All right, thank you. Uh, any new business? All right. Um, before we adjourn, um, they will be collecting the uh, surveys at the door. Um, so if you could have those ready um, on your way out, that would be very much appreciated. Do we have a motion? Oh, Dan? Okay, so we have a motion. Do we have a second? Renee? All right, so Renee is second. Uh, we don't uh, have a discussion for uh, that. Uh, so all in favor of adjourning, say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, so we're boarding the buses out in front of the hotel. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>